today's topic actually uh, we, normally people think it is prayer but i've made it different i i i i going to speak on enjoying god's presence and it's very very white important for us all of us as believers to learn to enjoy our fellowship with god and um, i am basing this uh, today's message on psalm 46 verse 10 where it says be still and know i am god now normally this particular verse is used in the context of uh, waiting on the lord you know when you pray about some matter and the prayer is not immediately answered or not answered the way we when it we wanted to be answered when it does appears to be a delay in the answer to our prayer uh, people uh, are advised other so be still and know he is god don't hurry up don't push god well that's fine no doubt about it that's very biblical not to push god because in the book of isaiah chapter 5 verse 19 says woe to him who says let god hurry but today i'm going to speak on this particular uh, verse in a different perspective be still and know i am god Now the word God there is the same word used in Genesis one one Elohim 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 is actually plural is plural and I believe it refers to the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit the Triune God and uh, you know when you go to God in prayer uh, we say Father I come to you in the name of Jesus and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us to pray in John sixteen twenty three Jesus says. what i ask the father in my name he will do it so we go to the father in heaven in the name of jesus and we ask the holy spirit to help us to pray he is a helper uh, who helps us to pray according to the will of god romans 8 26 and 27 now when i talk about enjoying god's presence let's talk about what is where is god uh, where is his presence In the Old Testament time, we read in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah fifty-seven, verse fifteen: "I live in a high and a holy place, but also with him who's contrite at heart, who's humble at heart. With him, it doesn't say in him, but with him, in a high and a holy place, also with him who's contrite at heart." In the New Testament, the Lord lives in us. Actually, God fills heaven and earth because He is a spirit. In the book of Jeremiah, twenty-third chapter, verse twenty-four, God says, "Can anyone hide in secret places that I don't see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth?" God fills heaven and earth, but we know that having accepted Christ as Savior, Lord, the Lord has come to dwell in us. In fact, all three, Elohim. live in us how do you know that the father lives in us ephesians chapter 4 verse 6 christ lives in us colossians 127 the holy spirit lives in us first corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 isn't it amazing to know that father lives in us he lives in all it says all believers ephesians chapter 4 verse 6 not on this verse go back and read it check it out in the scriptures christ lives in us Colossians one twenty seven, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when you go to God in prayer, when you say, "Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus," we become aware of the fact He lives in us. You don't have to go here and there searching for God. In fact, the woman at the, at the well asked Jesus, "Our forefathers worship in the mountain at Mount Gerizim. The mountain had a temple on top of Mount Gerizim in Samaria." You Jews say there is a place to worship. Since she is asking Jesus, where should we worship? His answer was not where to worship, but how to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. John four twenty four. So today we have this amazing privilege that because He lives in us, we can choose to have fellowship with Him any time, anywhere, any place, in any position. Sitting, standing, kneeling, lying prostrate. Anyway, he lives inside us. Now, when he says, "Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus," just understand who we have come to. Come to the Creator, Elohim. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
He's an awesome God, awesome God. And when you go to an awesome God, the first response of us should be reverence and awe. Reverence and awe. Be still and know I am God. Yes, you are my child. I'm a heavenly father, but I am God. And this God, but the breath of his mouth created the heavens and the earth. If you look at uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, it talks about how by the word of the Lord the heavens were created, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. Very often I shared this, especially when I spoke on the God of creation last year, how the awesome God created the heavens and the earth. And look at the universe, a vast universe. We understand that there are 10 into 20 power 22 solar systems in the whole uh, universe. So many Milky Ways, so many stars, so many solar systems. Huge universe. We can only begin to fathom what it is. Nobody can know completely. And this God, by the breath of his mouth, he just spoke. The universe came into existence. An awesome God we serve. Which means when you come to him, we are still before him and honor the awesomeness of God, the reverence of God. If you look at Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 1 onwards, Solomon writes, Guard your steps when you go to the house of the Lord. Go near to listen and offer the sacrifice of fools. Don't be quick with your mouth and hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. Let your words be few. Those days they went to the temple to pray, to have fellowship with God. He says, He's an awesome God we serve. And go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools. Listen to him more than talking to him. In fact, verse 7 says, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 7, stand in awe of God. Reverence, awe. Now, as we remember this God, awesome God, who created the heavens and the earth, we remember He is our Heavenly Father. We are His children. And He says, I love you with an everlasting love. And even before you talk to Him, what I do is I'm going to share how I spend my, enjoy my presence, or God's presence in my life. It's not the only way. I always say when I've spoken biblical meditation also has said, it's not the only way to learn the Bible. There are many ways, but I'm going to share my own uh, personal experience of my walk with God. It's very biblical. There are other ways also. You know, whenever I speak on prayer, I'm a little uh, nervous. I'll tell you why. How can I tell a child how to talk to the parent? You want to be, you love your parents, you love your, so how can I tell them how you should talk? So when I talk to believers about, you know, uh, enjoying God and spending time with God, I must understand that, you know, uh, they are God's children. I am a God's child. I am a child of God. You are all children of God. But there are biblical principles in how to enjoy our fellowship with God. He is an awesome God who has made a way by which any time, anywhere, any place, we can approach him with freedom and confidence. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 12, we read about Jesus. is written, in him, and through faith in him, we can approach God to freedom and confidence. Similarly, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 19, it's written, Since we are confessed to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open through the curtain, let's draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. By the blood of Jesus, by faith in his blood, in his name, he said, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And we just believe we are in the presence of God. Just believe. It's by faith. And thereafter, be still and know who he is. Know his nature, his awesomeness. We are his children. He is a heavenly father. We are called to stand in awe of God. Go in to listen, then offer the sacrifice of fools. In other words, you make a vow and you break it. Don't be foolish like that. In many ways, we Christians, we don't make vows, but we talk foolishly to God sometimes, not knowing the nature of God. 
foolishly, super, super pluralist prayers. I'll give you some examples. Oh Lord, please be loving Lord. God says, I am love. 1 John 4, 16. Please be merciful, Lord. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9 says, He is merciful, God. He is already forgiven us of our sins on the cross. He is a forgiving God. Please be gracious to me, Lord. First Peter 5, 10, He is a God of all grace. Lord, please be comforting to me, Lord. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, He is a God of all comfort. Lord, uh, can you do this for me, Lord? Is it possible, Lord? God says, with me, nothing is impossible. Luke 1, 37. Help me, Lord. He is a helper. Hebrews 2, 18. When he faced temptations, he says, because he is a sub of being tempted, he is able to help those being tempted. More often than not, we tell God things, he is already there. He's all, that's his nature. Superfluous prayers. Instead of that, thank him. Let's talk, not talk foolishly to God. Oh, please be loving to me, Lord. Be gracious to me, Lord. As if we are recommending some God a uh, case to somebody about somebody. Lord, please be gracious to me. Because I am God of all grace. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. So knowing God means be still and know I am God. Know my nature. Understand who I am. It's my nature to show mercy and, and uh, be loving and kind. Lord, please do nice things to me, Lord. He loves to do good to us. He will never stop doing good to us. We look at, I very often share this passage. Jeremiah chapter 32, 38 to 41. God says, They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action that they'll always fear me for their own good, for the good of the children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. What an amazing God. And I will inspire them to fear me, that they'll never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them. And today we are beneficiaries of this amazing grace. Another prayer, Lord, please bless me, Lord. John 1.16, from the fullness of his grace, we receive one blessing after another blessing. Overflow of blessing, going on blessing us in so many ways. In fact, trials, <coughs> trials in the will of God are a blessing for us. Please understand that. So we don't know him and we tell him many things about him. He knows everything. He knows everything. And then we say, Lord, I'm a sinner. He knows I'm we are sinners. I'm weak, Lord. He remembers we are dust. So let's be very clear about who we have come to. We stand in awe of God. Rebel him for who he is. One extreme is to tell God what he already knows about him and what he knows about us. Instead of telling him, listen and thank God for his nature. Thank God that he always does what is best for us. Now, another thing is, some people are too familiar with God. They think intimacy with God means you can tell God anything. We have to rebel him. Rebel God. Closeness to God doesn't mean familiarity. Closeness to God means reverence. You know, the Bible talks about a Levi, the priest. He had not been given physical land in the land of Canaan. But God made a very special covenant with him. No physical inheritance in the land, no land for him in, in, in Israel. But God told him in the book of Joshua 18, 7, 18 chapter 7, the priestly service of God is their inheritance. The priestly service of God is their inheritance. Then, in Malachi chapter 2, 5 to 7, God says, My covenant with him was a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This call for reverence, he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was his mouth. Nothing false was found upon his lips. And look at this. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. He revered me and walked with me. Walking with God, intimately walking with God, doesn't mean familiarity. Oh, I walk with him. I talk to him. I fight with him. And you can tell him anything. He's my heavenly father. 
Go to fight with your daddy. I fight with my daddy. Now, the point is this. He is God. Be still and know I am God. I am an awesome God. If you look at book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verse 17, talks about how your God, the God of gods and Lord of laws, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Your God is God of gods and Lord of laws, the great God, mighty and awesome. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 10, 17. Yes, I look at the universe and see a little bit of the universe, what we see now, the naked eye. And realize what an awesome God we serve. Be still. Don't talk too much. Talking comes later. Understand who he is. His nature, his compassion, all the attributes of God. Last year, I did an entire series on attributes of God. If you look at all the attributes of God, you realize very often, the same attributes he already has, we tell him, and like I told you, know, be gracious to me, Lord, his grace. Be loving to me, his love. Help me, Lord, is the source of all help. Be merciful, I am merciful. He says, I am, I am a merciful God. Forgive me, Lord, I have already forgiven you. Be gracious, I am the God of all grace. Comfort me, I am the God of all comfort. So we, we tell God what all is. Thank him for who he is. So take, take some time understanding who he is. What I do in the morning when I get up, I'm going to talk about my own experience and I'll bring back God's word also why I do that. When I get up in the morning, first thing I do, early morning, is the Father I come to in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, and I thank him for the blood that has cleansed me of every sin. Then I realize I've come to holy God. Holy God. In Leviticus 20.26, it says, God says, you are to be holy to me. Because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from nations to be my own. You are my own. I realize I'm his. I'm his. I've come to him. I belong to him. I'm his. And because I'm his, I serve him. I like the way uh, the Apostle Paul, he tells the, his fellow uh, passengers <laughs> who are going to Rome in the ship, and there's a the, the, uh, storm. And then he's telling everybody along, the prisoners plus the people who are on the ship on the way to Rome. The book of uh, Acts, 27 chapter, verses 23 and 24. 23 and 24. Last night, he says to them, last night, an angel of the God, whose I am and who I serve, appeared to me. Whose I am and who I serve. How wonderful. We belong to him. We are his, and therefore we serve him. Such joy there is in serving that God. So I say, I know he's a holy God. I belong to him. He's made me his own, which means because he is holy, we have to be holy. And therefore, in the beginning of my prayer time, I ask him, Holy Spirit, Lord, show me, Lord, any area in my life that Not right before you. Something is not right before you, Lord, in my life. Show me, Lord. I take some time to ask him to counsel me because he's a counselor. The Holy Spirit is a counselor. Isaiah 11, chapter verse 2, he counsels us, meaning he makes us aware of any particular thing that displeases God. As uh, Moses wrote in Psalm 90, Psalm 90, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And something that is in our hearts which doesn't please God, He will reveal to us. Then accept it. Don't try to reason out with God. Oh Lord, everybody has some mistake. This is my weakness. As if everyone has a right to some weakness. Simply accept it. And then ask Him to empower you to put it away. The Holy Spirit is a counselor and empowerer. As the 11th chapter was true. Remember, we are going to have enjoy this God who is holy, who is love personified, all the attributes of God, and going to have fellowship with you. are going to enjoy his presence by faith. So make sure that nothing hinders that relationship. One more thing that hinders relationship is even an iota of 
bitterness. If you have something against somebody, please confess it and forsake it. That, that idea of unforgiveness. In Mark 11, 24 and 25, the Lord says, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe receive it and be yours. And when you stand praying, remember who are ending against anyone, forgive him that a father will forgive you. Which means we can't even begin to enjoy God's presence in our lives, in our fellowship with God. We can't even begin to enjoy if you have an iota of bitterness. You go to God and pray, remember something you have again. Forgive that person unconditionally. Why? Because God has forgiven you. When he forgives, he forgets. Even in the Old Testament time, at a time that when the norm was eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, the psalmist writes in Psalm 130 verse 3, Psalm 130 verse 3, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who can stand before you? With you there is forgiveness. And therefore you are feared. If God kept a record of our sins, where will we stand? He has a fantastic memory, you know. He is God. But God chooses not to keep a record of our sins. So we should not keep a record of our sins. And when you have some bitterness, God will show you. My dear child, you come to me to have to enjoy my presence. Wonderful. You come to me. I appreciate that. But there's something there in your heart. Put it away. If you want to enjoy fellowship with the God whose love, we should be willing to love people unconditionally. At the very beginning of a prayer time, every time we go to God and pray, one-to-one, -one, in a large group, we may not be able to do that. But one-to-one, -one, when you go, make sure that you put away every hindrance. And sometimes certain things in your life may not be a sin, actually. You may not be convinced it is sin, but it hinders. Something hinders. May not be convinced, you may not be convinced of sin. That's why you find in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, we read from verse 1. Since we have the sound of the great thought of witnesses, let us throw away everything that hinders and the sin that entangles. Two things mentioned. Everything that hinders and the sin that entangles us. Sin is different. There's something else, it may not be a sin in your idea, in your mind, but it's hindering your relationship with God. Not able to enjoy the fellowship with God. Put it away. Throw it away. Then we are in a position to enjoy this fellowship with God. Now some people ask me, brother, uh, how, do you, how do you picture as God? Or do you have a, have a picture in front of you? We should never worship any uh, image or picture. We all know that. So how do you, uh, you know, actually, what do you think of when you pray when you come before God? What is the image you have in your mind? Now the Bible says, God lives in unapproachable light. We look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. It's written very clearly that God, the best and only ruler, who lives in unapproachable light, who alone is immortal, who alone is immortal, who lives in un unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. No one has seen or can see. He lives in unapproachable light. If no one has seen him, then who was... Who was he who appeared to all these people in the Old Testament, Moses, so many people, God, God appeared to them. Who was that person? So Jesus. How do you know that? In John 1, 18, it's written, No one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten Son, who the Father said, has made him known. He has made him known. So every appearance of God in the Old Testament was actually Jesus. Now, how do we pictureize Jesus today? When come to say, Father, come to the name of Jesus. I imagine I'm unapproachable light, bright light. I can't even imagine that. Unapproachable. He says, Father, I come to you. You are a bright light, Lord. But I relate to Jesus because in the, in the, in the, in the, book, of, in the book of Revelation, the description about of John seeing Jesus. Very interesting, you have noticed in the four Gospels, no? you will never find anyone describing the physical features of Jesus. Nothing is mentioned. Not even about Mary. But I can tell you one thing. How did Jesus look? Whom did he look like? 
normally every child uh, uh, looks like one of the parents or grandparents or whatever isn't it abo jesus like no you know why he can't he could not look like joseph he could not look like joseph at all he looked like mary because he was born of a virgin all the physical features he had must have been like mary mary description not get revealed also in the bible so nobody knows so you can't make any picture of jesus you can't make any picture you can't make an image nobody knows how he looked but i tell you one thing in the book of revelation we find john describes the lord jesus christ that's the picture i have when i pray in the morning is the father come to jesus name your bright light lord i can't see you lord unapproachable light but jesus i come and report to you through you only i come to the god the father i'm reporting to you and i report to him and i look at this amazing image in the book of revelation which uh, john describes one description we have of jesus in in the book of uh, revelation by john and in the, in the actual gospels you'll find after he rose from the dead you'll find that uh, uh, he appeared in different form mark 16 chapter was 12 says he appeared in a different form some different form he appeared what form we don't know but revelation chapter 1 12 to 16 is what i use when i say jesus I come and report to you and there it says about uh, john seeing jesus someone is son of man walking among the lampstands seven lampstands the robe reaching down to his feet a golden slash around his chest this is found in revelation chapter 1 12 to 16 robe reaching down to his feet a golden slash around his chest head and hair white as wool as white as snow eyes like blazing fire feet like bronze glowing in a furnace his voice like the sound of rushing waters then hand he has he has seven stars in his hand from his mouth came a sharp double edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance there's some mental picture there so i just comes a lord thank you lord i come to you lord to you i come to the father in heaven who is unapproachable light i am your child lord you live in me lord and then i remind myself of the attributes of god you are a god of love god of mercy god of forgiveness god of compassion god of grace god of holiness who is faithful to all your promises i thank him for his nature i don't tell him be merciful be forgiving be loving he is that's his nature i thank you lord you do what is best for us lord don't i ask you to be nice to me lord you are the personification of goodness so thank him that's the meaning of no he is god be still don't talk too much remember who i am be still and know i am god i love you with an everlasting love how often you find christians telling lord please once again tell me lord you love me lord you know when they do something wrong they wonder if god still loves them or not jeremiah 313 god says i have loved you with an everlasting love i have drawn you with loving kindness so we will never tell god if you know him you still don't know he is god you never say lord please be loving lord he is love he is a personification of love god does doesn't love he is love and the bible says in the book of romans chapter 8 38 and 39 i'm convinced that neither death nor paul writes neither death nor life that the angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus nothing can separate us from the love of god if you do something wrong sometimes god disciplines us that's because he rebukes those whom he loves he punishes those who he accepts as a son and he punishes uh, punishes us that we share in his holiness 12 chapter of hebrews read verse 5 to 11 beautiful passage whenever you think that god is uh, you know uh, punishing you or rebuking you or you know chastising you read the particular passage because he loves us he rebukes those whom he loves whatever he does always the best not just good it's best so coming back here we come in the name of jesus for the blood of jesus put away every sin everything god speaks to you in the heart about your your condition before god 
confess it, forsake it, and then any bitterness throw it away. Make sure you're right with God. You come to God whose holiness personified. Because he's holy, he wants us to be holy. And then thank him for his nature. And thereafter, tell him, Lord, you love me, Lord, and I love you, Lord. I come for you to enjoy my fellowship, for me to enjoy you. Even before you ask God for things, nothing wrong, by the way, nothing wrong in asking God for things. Prayer is also important, petitioning, asking God for things, nothing wrong. But before that, please learn to enjoy his presence by faith. Tell him, Lord, I've come to you because you love me and I love you. And our fellowship with God is very precious to God. A child going to the parent and saying, I come to you uh, for you. I always share this when I speak on fellowship with God. You know, when the children come to you for something, always they come to you ask for things. When Akshay was a small boy, he used to come, I used to go on tour and come back. I used to buy something for him whenever I go. And other times he used to ask me, I want this, I want that. So he used to ask me things. So every time he comes to me, if he's asking me for things, the following time when he comes, what will I tell him? What do you want this time? What do you want this time? Every time you come to me, you want something. This time, what do you want? Because I'm assuming whenever he comes to me, he wants something. So next time, what do you want this time? That's the question I'll have. Sometimes when you go to God in prayer, always asking God for things, he might even ask us, if you listen to him, what do you want this time? Instead of asking me for things, if Akshay says, uh, Daddy, I've come to you. Uh, you've gone on tour and come back. No, I just want to sit next to you. I want to be with you. How happy I'll feel. How happy I'll feel. So now you understand what's meaning of enjoying God's presence. Don't go to him only for things. Lord, I come to you, Lord. I'm your child. You're my heavenly father. I just want to be with you, Lord. To enjoy your presence. To enjoy your presence. And that pleases God. When you go to heaven one day, it's very precious to God. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of God are the death of his saints. Our leaving this world is precious to God. Because it's a homecoming. Now we are here in this world, like I've been sharing of, of late after during the lockdown period, that we're only here to serve nothing else. About David, uh, it's written in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 36, when Paul testifies, I think it's an economy where he's testifying, there he says about David, Acts 13, 36, when David had served God's purpose for his generation, he fell asleep. He gathered his forefathers and his body decayed. When we fulfill God's purpose for our lives in this world, He'll take us home. Body will decay. We'll be gathered to our near and dear ones in heaven. We'll meet all our near and dear ones in heaven. Of course, most important is God. And it's a tremendous homecoming. Tremendous homecoming. Where God rejoices that we have come back home. That's what to happen when you go to heaven. And I'm sure when I go to heaven one day, First thing God will tell me is, Raj, now you can't run away anywhere. Now you cannot run away anywhere. When you're on earth, you spend some time in the morning, quiet time, again, maybe evening, sometimes the day. Most of them are away. Yes, you are serving me. I understand you are serving me. But I want you. I want your heart. I want you. I want to enjoy you. Now I can enjoy you all the time. You can run away anywhere. That's why it's so precious to God. I'll go into heaven. Precious to God. Don't look at death as something terrible. If we don't die, we fall asleep. How many people today are so confused about what's happening in the world today? What's happening in the world? Oh, I prayed so much, brother, and we fasted and prayed as a church, but that person died of COVID. You know, and we can feel so bad as if God let us down, as if only through our prayer, God. Our life is in the hands of God. We can't go to heaven one day before He wants us to go to heaven. We have finished our work here. Many people left us in the last one month, one and a half, two months. I know so many people very close to me have gone to be with the Lord. And I look at it as God, the promotion for them. 
So that's how it is for us. We are all going to go one day. But today, please enjoy God. Enjoy Him. You go to heaven, you'll enjoy Him anyway. There's no choice. Where will you go? You can't go anywhere else. Only in heaven. And you enjoy the, uh, the time with God in heaven. So it's very important for us to understand that. So in this world itself, please learn to enjoy your fellowship with God. For God to do things for us is nothing great. Nothing is impossible. I mean, tell God that also, no? Lord, can do this for me. Lord, is it possible, Lord, you can do this for me? Nothing is impossible, God. With him, nothing is impossible. Luke 137. Thank him. He will do it. He will do it. Anything too hard for me, God says. Nothing is too hard for God. Then you give lectures to God in prayer. Lord, he's doing this, he's doing that. Whole story of somebody else will tell God. You know what God will say? I'm omniscient. I know everything. I know everything about you. I know everything about that person. Don't give me lectures. Listen to me. We tell God, advise God on so many matters. Enjoy him. And say, Lord, I'm commanding this person to in your hands, of Lord. Do with him what is best for him to change his life. When you pray for people's life to be changed, it pleases God. When you pray for people to become more like Jesus, for us to become more like Jesus, it pleases God. So after settling your, yourself right with God, Take some time to enjoy his presence, thanking him for who he is and reminding yourself who you are to God. Who God is, don't forget. When you remember who God is, then you will not get discouraged. You know, Psalmist in Psalm 42 is actually Korah, Korah of the Psalmist. And his sons actually wrote Psalm uh, 46, which is, be still and know I am God. Korah's sons wrote that psalm. Every psalm is not David's psalm, okay? <laughs> don't think every psalm is David's psalm. Uh, Korah wrote, uh, Asaf wrote, uh, Moses wrote, of course, David wrote most of the psalms. And uh, Ezra wrote Psalm 119. So actually, Korah wrote Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know. Sorry, uh, he wrote uh, uh, Psalm 42, verse 5. Uh, 46, verse 10 written by the sons of Korah, set to music. All the psalms are set to music. Korah, he writes in Psalm 42. Verse 5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For yet praise you, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. I will remember you. So in your fellowship time with God, and enjoying God's presence, remember who he is. Be still and know I am God. I would recommend to you in the next uh, few weeks or whatever, go back to that last year's message on uh, nature of God. Nature of God. 20 different aspects of God. Know who He is. Be still and know I am God. Once you remember who He is, most of prayer time, we will not, uh, we will, we will, we will not be there. 90% of prayer will be reduced. For example, people say, no, uh, Lord, please be with me, Lord. He's already inside you. Wherever you go, He goes. What's the point in saying, be with me? Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Be with the church, some people pray. He's the head of the church. So most of the time, when we know who God is, we still don't know who He is, our prayer time reduced by maybe 90%. We just be quiet and enjoy God. And then when you go out to minister to people, you'll know exactly what to say. What to say. You already told you what you have to speak. What do you have to do? So I fellowship with him. So please let your prayer time, fellowship time, primarily be a time of enjoying his fellowship, enjoying his presence, and his presence is in us always. The thing is, when you cut off from all the other things of this world, activities, that time you're busy with so many things, with your work, with your office, studies, whatever, so many things. Early morning is a very good time to enjoy God. In fact, even about Jesus, it says in Mark 1.35, Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, when it's still dark, he got up, left the house, went to salty place where he prayed. Salty place where he prayed. Left the house. Early morning, set apart time to be with the Father. And we should all set apart time, I believe. And he will give us, uh, give us a time of enjoying with him. And also give us the exact words we have to go speak to other people. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 4, we read, God says, uh, Isaiah writes, 
as a 50 verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given instructed tongue to know the world that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. Early morning, enjoy your time with God, then listen to him. Listen to him. One is to be still and know his God, his attributes, his nature. Remember him. Then remember who you are to God. It's very important to know that because then otherwise you get discouraged. Even that I shared in, the, in our Zoom meetings on remembering identity in Christ is there in the miscellaneous section. Different aspects of identity. 14 different aspects of identity that, that never change. When you remember who you are to God, who God is to you, then you enjoy that relationship. You'll never complain. You'll never question. You'll never argue with God. How can you complain to God when you're so precious to God? You know what a, what a precious instrument you are to God. He delights over us. He sings over us. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. When you go to God in prayer, remind, remind yourself, he is delighting over you. Because he purchased you by his blood. You have been purchased by his blood. You belong to him. You are on his hands and no one can snatch you out of his hands. John 10, 28. And in his hands, there are a crown of splendor, a royal diadem in the hand of God. Isaiah 62, verse 3. Forget about circumstance around you. God is the same, never changes. Your identity in Christ never changes. You are a child of God, remain a child of God. When these two don't change at all, why can't we always worship him and praise him for who he is and who we are to him? Man was created for his glory. Isaiah 43 verse 7. We are created to proclaim his praise. Isaiah 43 verse 21. But that man, first man, sinned against God. They were corrupted. Today we have been renewed in the image of the creator. So you go back to glorifying him and praising his name independent of circumstances. That will happen when you have an intimate, close relationship with God where you enjoy him, praise him, thank him and never complain. Philippians chapter 2, 14 to 16. Philippians, second chapter, 14 to 16. Do everything without complaining or arguing. So that, him, so that make him blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. As you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life. When you walk intimately with God and enjoy his presence, there's no place for grumbling, no place for arguing with God, no place for questioning God. Some people misunderstand closeness to God will be, oh, I can complain, I can argue, he's my heavenly father. No, we are called to be a people who rever him. Stand in awe of God. Levi walked with God in peace and uprightness. He revered God. Reverence and familiarity don't go together. Reverence means respect him for who he is, honor him, yet you are close to him because he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you my friends. You are my friend. Being a friend of his, we rever him, we honor him, and please learn to enjoy his presence simply by faith. By faith. Christian life is by faith. Doing his will is by faith. Knowing him more and more is by faith. Everything is by faith. And good, the good news for us is faith is a gift of God. So let your prayer time be primarily time of enjoying God. Thereafter, I go in a time of also praying for people. I pray for people's needs, especially now with so many things happening, uh, with the, the uh, COVID spreading everywhere. I do pray for people to be healed. Some get healed miraculously. The last Sunday night, we had some very good testimonies on the night Zoom. And some that pass away. How do you look at that? I was sharing with uh, some doctors and about, uh, you know, the, the three possibilities 
in this period of coronavirus and COVID, three possibilities for people, Christians especially. Okay. Psalm 91 verse 14 talks about, God says, because he, and he said, I'll protect him because he acknowledges my name. I'll protect him because he acknowledges my name. You call upon my name, I'll protect you. And that name is Jesus. In John 17, 11, the Lord told the Father in heaven, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. So protection in Jesus' name. Same Psalm 91, 14 says, God says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. Because he loves me, I will rescue him. If we love God, which means you obey him, we do his will, we show our love for him. He might get COVID, but he'll rescue him. He'll rescue him. He'll come out of it. First possibility, you don't get it. Protection. Jesus' name. Call upon his name. Second possibility, you get COVID and you get healed because you love, you love him. And God says, if God loves me, I'll protect him. I'll, I will rescue him. Third possibility is when you go home, when you leave this world. How do you look at that? That's ultimate healing. Isaiah 53 verse 5. By his wounds we are healed. That word healing is Rafa. Rafa means made whole. Make no mistake. Our ultimate being made whole is going to Jesus and being with him. Okay, we spend some time in the morning, sometime in the evening, fellowship with God. Go to heaven, whole time you have fellowship with God. In his presence, pleasures forevermore. Here, yeah, how much of present we enjoy with him? Morning, evening, little commitment during the day, some prayer. And you go to heaven all the time, we worshiping him, praising him, thanking him, enjoying. Enjoying. Then we won't make petitions. When you go to heaven, we won't make petitions there. There's no crying, no mourning, no sorrow, no pain, no death. No death, no crying. No pain, no sorrow. Only eternal joy and eternal enjoyment of his presence. Here, unfortunately, for some time, we can look at the circumstances, get upset about it. When you get upset by circumstances and mind is weary, simple solution. Go to him again. Give your burdens to him and don't think about it. So after you enjoy enjoying a fellowship time with God, enjoying his presence, what you do is, whatever bothers you, know, give it to him. And please don't take it back. When people share the, the request to you and they share the burdens, don't take it personally. You can't solve the problem. You cannot solve it. Life and death is in the hands of God. What you can do is share the gospel. Tell them to call upon the name of Jesus. So we as believers, we know where we are going. So while living in this world, let's enjoy our fellowship with him. Enjoy his presence. All the time we can enjoy his presence. Wherever we go, he goes. Very often I share this about Moses. No? When they came from Egypt, when they camped along the way, in the tent of meeting, he would talk to uh, God. Moses would talk to God. And it says in the book of Exodus, 33rd chapter, verse 9 to 13, the passage, Whenever Moses went to tent of meeting, God would appear upon that place. His presence, his presence would be there. When Moses went, God came. Not the other way around. When God came, Moses went. Any time Moses went there, God was there. For you and me, the Lord is in us. Always. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. We slumber, we sleep. All the time. I, I slumber and sleep sometimes when I'm about to pray, I slumber and sleep. But God doesn't slumber and sleep. To get up in the middle of the night and talk to me is there in, in me. So learn to enjoy God. Don't always go with petitions. Always pray, oh, give me, give me, give me. Then people are very upset these days. I prayed so much, whole church was praying for this person, brother. We fasted and prayed. And why God did this? Why he died? Today only one person rang up. And uh, he was crying. I'm, I felt sorry for him because he was, didn't understand that. His, his mother passed away last week in COVID. So his friend asked me to talk to me. So I told him, see, your mommy has gone to the Lord. She's enjoying that. Don't feel sorry for her. You'll miss her. But, and then you're so comforted. And if you have to understand that today, we believers should understand what leaving this world is all about. It's about going to heaven. So why not hear yourself? Enjoy your God. Walk with him intimately and closely. 
Enoch walked with God 300 years and was taken up into heaven. He didn't experience death. God took him away. So as he keep on enjoying God, he, God may not take us to heaven without us dying. He might die uh, in, in terms of physical death. But we have walked closely with God. Very soon you'll find yourself in heaven. Very soon you'll find yourself in heaven. Slow, slowly walking with God and just a transition from the earthly surroundings, you find heavenly surroundings. Nothing like walking with God. And don't always go with petitions. Nothing wrong asking God. You are a child of God. I'm a child of God. We can ask him many things. Always when I pray nowadays for people for healing, end of my prayer, I say, Lord, I've asked that you heal this person, Lord. And if you heal him, Lord, use him for your glory, Lord. Let not this person leave this world without knowing you. That's my prayer. If we are all going to leave one day, Lord, let not this person leave this world without knowing you. But if you choose to take him home, Lord, let your will be done, not my will. Always close that, your prayer with this prayer. I'm asking, Lord, as your child, I want this person to be healed, Lord, for the family's sake, for everything. But, Lord, you know what is best, Lord. I will graciously accept your perfect will, Lord. They have no regret. They have no regret because he heard your prayer. He always hears our prayers. Don't ever doubt God hearing your prayers. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 says, Our prayers are like incense in golden bowls in God's presence. So don't make your prayer life like shopping. You go to shopping, you take a list. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Instead of that, take a blank piece of paper. And write down what God tells you to do. As uh, Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, again quoting the passage, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 from verse 1, guard your steps and go to the house of the Lord. Go near to listen and offer the sacrifice of fools. Don't be quick with your mouth, hasty with your heart, taught anything before God. Verse 7 says, stand in awe of God. Rebel him, honor him. We go and listen rather than offer sacrifice of fools, foolishly talking, telling God what he already knows. Listen to God, go to the blank piece of paper. Lord, tell me what I should do, Lord. I will listen to you, Lord. You are my master, I am your servant. I can't tell you what you have to do to tell me what I should do, Lord. We we'll make it a habit of having fellowship with God, listening to his voice. Now, how does he speak? From the Bible. He can speak in many ways. I can't limit God. He can speak in visions and dreams and through people. He can talk any way he, talk. he can talk. But always check what you believe to be from God with the scriptures. God will never speak against the spirit of the scriptures. My prayer for all of us is, from this day onwards, more than petitioning, more than going on a hunger strike. Fasting can be hunger strike sometimes. Do this, do this, do this, Lord. I'm going to fast seven days, Lord. Do this, Lord. Instead of that, Learn to enjoy. He's a personification of love. He does what is best for us. We are very, very precious to him. Love him and pull for his purpose. Romans 8.28 Most people when they quote this verse, they quote the first half, not the second half. They say, in all things God works together for the good. They'll stop there. In all things God works together for the good. they stop there. What about the next part? For the good of those who love God and will call it according to his purpose. So that is important to understand. Only for such people, all things work together for the good. Those who love him and who call according to his purpose. So when you go to God in prayer, love him, enjoy him, enjoy his presence. Say, I love you, Lord. You love me, Lord. I want to just want to enjoy my fellowship with you. And then as he reveals to you what he wants you to do, be busy doing his will. Call according to his purpose. The purpose is fulfilled. He'll take us home. We'll join with our forefathers, our near and dear ones who have gone to heaven. It will be a reunion in heaven. In, by, by the way, our Thursday Bible study, we've been having that for the last, how many years? 83. You know, at least 20 people have passed away in the last few years. 20 people from our Thursday fellowship. Maximum we used to have in the Bible study was about 45, 50 people, maximum. Usually 20 people. In all these years, about 20, 25 people have gone. And they're having fellowship there. 
Thermopyl, that I think when people here at home and yeah, now nowadays I do on Zoom, but we have Bible at home, 15, 20 people be there. Everyone's gone there. It's a joy, great reunion. They be gathered to them one day. But the main person is our Lord. Look forward to being with them every morning or evening, whatever. More time you spend with them, the more you'll rise about difficulties. And uh, every burden you have, take it to them, leave it to them. A lot of people share their burdens with me. I don't take it personally. I'm only a postman. Take the petition, Lord, handle it, Lord. And then forget about it. I'm a postman delivering love letter from God to people and the request from people to God. That's all. That's all I do. Once I give it to God, I forget about it. My own situation, I forget about it. Other situations, I forget about it. Don't take it personally. The Tamil Nadu wrote that message to me. Over oh, terrible times they're facing. Every year, I'll get news about people that I'm devastated. How can you be devastated? You're not, you can't solve the problem. Life and death is in God's hands. Why should you be devastated? Remember where you are going. Share the gospel with people who are not, not saved. Those who are already saved, encourage them. But all starts with our personal time of enjoyment with God. Enjoy your time with God, His presence, and you'll find everything in life falls in place. Let's pray. Heaven, Father, thank you, Lord, each one of us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Holy Spirit, teach us. Help us to pray, Lord. Help us to worship Father and Jesus. And Lord, help us be people who value our relationship with you, Lord. To enjoy your presence as often as we can, Lord. And I thank you, Master. You have the best plans for us, Lord. You have great things in store for us in heaven and also on earth, Lord. Help us be busy doing your will. Fulfilling your purpose for our lives. And also loving you, Lord. And then we know for sure in all things, God works together for us. And we love you and fulfill your purpose. I commit all of us into your hands, Lord, that we will seek your counsel each and every day. Rise above difficulties and reign in life to the grace you give us, Lord. In Jesus' precious and matchless name I pray. Amen.